So uh, I'm back again. Uh, yes, let's see. Um, do you hear me? I hope so. Um, let's see. Again, should be okay. Yeah. Uh, I got the question now during the break, and um, about what to do when um, we have huge uh, number of images. Um, it depends on how long um, time dependence you w want to see. So I uh, suggested here that each image is depending on the previous one and the next one. Um, so uh, for that, if you only have that dependence, it would be sufficient to work on um, a sliding window uh, on three images. I would, however, probably look at a little bit longer sequence. Maybe not all the 15,000 that you are talking about here, but um, a little bit longer sequence. Uh, loading 15,000 frames um, would probably fill your memory, so that's not a good idea. So you'd probably need to work in, in windows or even overlapping windows. So you have some uh, overlap between the windows you analyze. Um, but um, yeah, certainly looking at the time windows um, of images is probably the solution to work with. It, uh, of course, it depends on how, how large the data is. Maybe you can see some trends in, um, in a longer run, uh, then of course you need to look at that. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, it's a question from experiment to experiment. So um, maybe if you show me uh, afterwards or at some point uh, what you are talking about, then we can discuss it in detail. So uh, uh, let's uh, look at um, voxel-based approaches now. <clears throat> um, now we are talking about, um, before we looked at identifying uh, items already and track where they uh, land, the voxel-based or pixel-based approach is about uh, uh, checking the correlation between different regions. And the correlation is actually a sum, uh, the average, of two uh, regions or two uh, images that um, are displaced a little bit and see how, how much uh, these two images are correlated. Um, the other, uh, you can also do this correlation in the Fourier space, which I will show um, in the end of this uh, section. <clears throat> uh, it's usually faster than uh, doing uh, scanning, uh, looking at different regions. So. Um, for this, uh, I now loaded some uh, data from uh, the MNIST dataset. So it's the handwritten number five. I think it was index two uh, in the dataset. Um, and now you can see that we have shifted it. Um, this is the original uh, T0 and T1 is shifted by minus three and, and two. And uh, now we want to see what we can find out about that. So first of all, uh, looking at the correlation in space, what we do is actually we sweep, um, we scan with the um, a shift uh, one image and scan and scan and scan and see when the, um, the sum of the product uh, between all elements in, in each configuration. And you can see in the beginning, there is maybe something that could look like it. And at some point, we have some nice hits around down here. Um, where you get the sum is uh, 14 and something. So that would be the place where we have exact match. And um, let's see, it's, yeah. The, um, this one is a bit too coarse, I would say. So. Um, it's not so easy. So uh, anyway, uh, you can see here anyway that we have um, a big hit about here, which would correspond to the same position as the, the, the other five. 
Uh, we can also look at other metrics like uh, the mean squared error or the root mean squared error and look for minima instead because if you have perfect overlap, um, then it would be image minus image, the same image, and that would result in a zero. So um, that's why we look for the minima. <clears throat> and what you can see here is that we have um, some positions. Uh, right now we have this movement and um, there is a minimum down here, um, which is a bit strange um, in this particular case. So this is only one example that we see here. Um, let's see if we can animate it. No, there wasn't. Hmm, that was strange. I think I need to go back to, to the code on this one because that doesn't sum up to me. Um, that's looked a bit strange. As you can see, it takes a little time to compute this. Now we are scanning through um, the images. So um, this line here is moving the image um, by some to, to some certain position. And uh, well, we just have to wait to see what the result is. Possibly now it is a bit confused, depending on what data I get, I got as input. But let's hope for the best. Well, while we are waiting, I can continue uh, looking at the. Uh, this looks a bit weird. But anyway, now we get something. No. Well, something went wrong on that one. So let, let's continue on, um, on the Fourier transform instead. So um, as I said before, um, we can also do the correlation instead of doing this uh, scanning where we take the image, multiply it with the other one, and uh, repeat and repeat and repeat. Uh, we can compute the Fourier transform of image A and of uh, image B and um, actually take the complex conjugate of that one, multiply it. Um, then we get um, the correlation between the images and to get back into the spatial domain, we have to do the inverse Fourier transform. And with that, we get nicely at, uh, my, uh, at uh, three and minus two. Uh, so it's actually flipped in how much they are moved. Um, we get a nice uh, intensity peak. And that's, I would say, probably the quicker way to get the correlation. Um, and it's pretty precise. The only thing is that you can't do sub-pixel scanning with the Fourier transform. You would be, in principle, be able to do it with, um, with a spatial domain case. So let's take a look at um, registration now. And uh, we want to, wait, 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 wait. Something went on too fast now. No, uh, it's still uh, looking at um, the same, yeah. Just, yeah, good. Excuse me? Yes? I have a quick question about the correlation image from yep. the Fourier transform. Mm -hmm. What exactly does that visualize? So is that image A, um, or what was what is the visualization there? Yeah, so you have uh, image A, image B, they are displaced as you can see. And uh, what you have here is the absolute value of, um, of uh, Fourier transform of A and the absolute of Fourier transform of B. Um, in the, inten the intensity signal is in, in principle the same. Actually, where you see this difference is in the phase shift. So you have um, amplitude and phase, and position is given in the phase, which I'm not showing actually. Um, and uh, when you multiply the two of them, the complex conjugates of them, um, 
of one of them actually. Um, when you multiply those two, you get the correlation. And you get the correlation in the Fourier space, but you want them in the real space, and that is what you get when you uh, have this one. Uh, you see there is some repetition, probably because of this structure is so um, re uh, oscillating, repeat, uh, have repeating structure, so it's probably seeing uh, a mix of the two places. So that's why you get the second peak here. Uh, is that clear enough? Yeah, thank you. Good. Thank you that. Good. So let's go back on um, <clears throat> this one. So we have, uh, we get our bone images and uh, we want, in the end, we want to register these images and um, we want to have them uh, matched. And I come to why we want that a little bit later. But anyway, right now we, we are just having uh, two, these two images. A uh, little bit displaced. You can see there's a shift in X and a shift in Y. Uh, we can also look at a smaller region, trying to do the correlation about that. Uh, it's a very small region, and you can see that they, they are not really matching, actually. So um, this, um, when you try to do this um, correlation map, we see that it's very tricky to find something that is really useful. And that's actually an indication that you can't use too small region when you try to do this uh, matching, because then you will not find something that makes sense. So you need to work with larger images. And when you, when you do that, you can see now that the correlation gives a very nice um, minimum at the displacement. So this was a minus 15 and 15, and that is exactly where we get uh, this. And um, in this case, we used um, the mean square error, error um in in this um calculation now registration um mostly when you have time series there is a, uh, something that is moving around it could be that uh, there is uh, vibrations in the system it could be that the the time steps are actually acquired at very different uh, times in in and uh, like in medical imaging, you have um, um, radiograph, uh, radiograph between uh, different um, stages of um, treatment, and you can see here that you want to try you want to try to match all these images into a single uh, position. Otherwise, it's difficult to compare if there are any changes uh, in the patient. So what we need now is a process where we try to match uh, the two images so that they always are on the same place. And um, before that, we can't do any real time series analysis. So registration is a very important step. Um, so what we need is um, we have two images. Uh, one is fixed and one is moving. And um, the fixed one is called the reference, and um, then we have something that we try to move in until they fit. The whole uh, registration process um, com um, consists of a couple of different steps. We have a transformation, interpolation, and then we need some metric to check uh, whether we did a good work, and an optimizer, which is moving around or telling the transformer where to, uh, to move. And uh, that can be illustrated with this um, graph where we have a um, fixed image, moving image, and then we have the transform matrix. The interpolator does uh, the moving task. And then finally, we have a metric here where we compi uh, compare it to the, um, to the fixed image. A little bit more complicated, we can also do it <coughs> um, in this way where we squeeze in an optimizer and that um, based on the metric is trying to find the best uh, transform uh, at the current moment and then sends the transform parameters to the interpolator and um, then we do the moving 
and again go into the metric. So it's an iterative process where it's step by step is getting closer and closer to what we want to have. Um, yeah, that was already said. And in the transform, we have different kinds of transform. Uh, we can have affine transformation, we can have translations, we can have scaling, uh, deformation, uh, and shearing. That's kind of deformation as well. Um, until uh, we find the right um, case. So, for example, if you have um, an X, uh, an X-ray image um, taken at one hospital, it's probably not going to be on the same, um, exactly the same scale as um, the X-ray image on a on a different hospital. So, uh, then we need to do some uh, scaling to fit the two images into the the same grid. The interpolator that we can use um, very different schemes. Nearest neighbor interpolation is the easiest, the cheapest, uh, but less precise. So it's getting a bit noisy. You get some biases in the data. And then you can uh, continue with a lot of different um, interpolation schemes by linear, by cubic, B spline, et cetera, et cetera, in order to get more precise. Um, uh, resampling of the data so when uh, when you uh, do the fit the metric um, the metric as such um, we can use the average but um, it's probably not good enough so mean squared error is uh, a very easy way to to work with uh, you have a structure uh, similarity index metric or you can also work with correlation if you want that so there are a lot of metrics that we can play with uh, and probably it's very much application dependent which one is actually doing the job for you and also what kind of structures you see and so on. Um, the optimizer, of course, we have also here a lot of uh, methods. Um, our typical one is the gradient descent, which is uh, very popular. And then you have a lot of other methods which are available actually in, in different libraries. Uh, so um, you can choose among those. Again, some are more complex, takes more time. And as you notice, I talk about complexity and time uh, very much. And that is it's exactly when we are talking about the big data, time is an issue. You have to find a method that gives you precise enough result, but that you don't have to wait years to get the, the output. So you have to balance those two in order to get the right uh, information. So uh, let's look at what we had until now. We had some kind of optimizer, that's a grid search, which we uh, were rolling, moving around the image uh, that we applied to the transform um, in the image. Uh, we had a nearest neighbor interpolator and a mean squared error um, metric. So this would be uh, what we have done until now, more or less. And uh, next step is uh, now to look at the registration of this uh, bone image. And um, now we get into a lot of code. Uh, sorry for that. But in principle, what I want to say here is um, that we're going to use uh, the library TensorFlow, which is a machine learning um, framework that helps you building up models for uh, handling the data. And in this case, we are talking about uh, moving around images and having some kind of optimizer. So the important thing is that we have some transform parameters, we have some interpolation, and in this case, we actually keep the rotation constant and only work with the offset, so the, the translations. Um, the other one is we have um, the minimizer. It's a mean squared error. And uh, we also have a gradient descent optimizer that should minimize the mean squared error. So that is a summary of this code. Um, 
And uh, actually, when I tried to get it running uh, yesterday, it's, I realized that TensorFlow has changed. So that's the reason why you see all this pink area here. That um, I need to rewrite this code actually to, to make it into TensorFlow version 2. But right now, it still works with TensorFlow 1. And um, the other thing is, uh, it probably works better on a Windows machine or possibly also a Linux machine. Uh, Mac and TensorFlow, they are not so good friends. So uh, it's probably harder to get it running on the Mac. Oops. Um, then we have, a, we can get the whole graph here. Uh, let's just look at, um, should show up. So now we just want to verify that we have the right graph in TensorFlow. You can see here now we have the metric, we have some transformer. Uh, this one is too tiny to see. Um, and uh, this is the whole system that we are working with. And now if we want to, uh, let's see, maybe I can get it running. Yeah. So we have some transform parameters. Um, the input image, the fixed image, and together they are optimizing stuff. Um, TensorFlow is something that I haven't introduced very much. We have kind of touched it a little bit uh, when we did um, uh, the machine learning, deep learning example, but uh, otherwise it's a very big package and uh, pretty many books about how to work with it. I can't claim I'm an expert at all on it, so I also have to work a little bit uh, to get uh, further on to with TensorFlow. Um, but anyway, let's run this optimization and then we can see what happens. It tries to move around. You can see that it's moving, but it's not really doing a fantastic job. So that's an indication that the optimizer either wasn't run long enough, or we may have used the wrong input information. So now is the question what we can do. And um, um, we can see here <clears throat> uh, what happens. Uh, this one needs to be run and continue next. Uh, now we tried with um, another optimizer looking at the different region but still it's not doing that fantastic. Um, let's um, check on and let's try. Now we had pretty steep gradients. Uh, maybe it was difficult for it to find some good uh, optimization map, map. So let's try um, converting the image into a distance map instead. And um, this would look like this. We first have the image, we do a segmentation, just do a distance map on that and see what we get. We get some kind of blobby landscape and that gives us a much uh, smoother gradient and trying with that now, we can get a much better uh, um, registration from this data. You can see here now that, um, let's see, now you can see that it's moving. And it's actually moving more or less to the right spot. And you can also see that the, the error image between the two is improving. And you can also see here that the, the um, uh, error function curve is improving and um, converging to something at the, at the end. So it, this is a way to, to work with um, in, um, in this, with these optimizers. And um, with that, uh, we can also try uh, doing something with a structural similarity in index, but uh, going back to the normal images and uh, see what comes out. And um, this needs to be run. And then we take the next one. And then you can see here now um, that it's moving around, but the structural similarity index has troubles getting the right spot also. So it's also maybe not the best metric to work with. You could hope that it should get better, but uh, apparently it didn't. Kind of got, got stuck somewhere. 
Uh, I tried running it with a little bit longer uh, number of iterations, but it still didn't find a good spot. Um, yeah. And uh, the other way is going for ITK and simple ITK, and there is also um, a library based on it. Um, uh, what was that called? Uh, well, anyway, there is an ITK ba based uh, library. It's, I think, uh, ITK in general is an um, image processing library that has de been developed for Im um, medical image processing. Uh, it's a part of the um, Digital Human project, so they have played along with this um, uh, Digital Human um, data set. And um, it's a very powerful package, maybe not so Python-like. Um, it's written in C++ originally. And, um, but it's, it does a pretty good uh, work with, um, with the registration. There are also tools like, um, um, oh, what's it called now? 3D Slicer, which is um, based on uh, ITK and um, is, can be used uh, with a graphical user interface. You can um, e more easily do the registration tasks if you want to do it on a few examples and play with it a little bit. It also helps you to introduce fiducial points, which can be helpful when you want to, uh, when you know some specific points in the data that are, um, that are landmarks. So ITK is a large package that we can use. And um, that also pretty, requires a lot of code uh, as it is com uh, not the uh, very Python-like uh, structure, but anyway, um, you can take a look at these examples afterwards if you want, if you need and want to work with uh, ITK. Uh, but it does, it should be able to actually do a pretty good um, uh, registration. In this particular case, it didn't end up well actually, uh, which uh, was a bit confusing to me. Uh, it's actually introduced even what you can see here, um, added also shearing in, in, and rotation in the data. Um, which is something we haven't done until now, and that makes the whole uh, optimization process much harder. So often when you have a registration task, you can say how many degrees of freedom you want to uh, register. Um, in some cases, it's enough just to do um, um, the linear translations, um, but in other cases, you need to rotate and possibly even you you need to have um, a grid um, optimization that it's actually have deformable grids uh, that needs to be uh, modified in order to, uh, to register two images. That's uh, a very common case if you have medical data. If you have organs, uh, organs are pretty soft, uh, um, blobby uh, items, and they may change also over time in particular um with patients if they have some um bad organ it may uh, grow or or shrink depending on the stage of of, uh, of the disease so uh, for that you need also this um, non-rigid uh, registration so that, that's a lot of uh, options that you can uh, you have to work with when you start doing a registration with data and then again, it depends on the application, how much you can simplify the optimization. Uh, there is also the possibility of uh, dividing the data into smaller pieces and with that maybe speed up and possibly even um, looking at some say characteristic regions and use them to find the big, um, big registration parameter set and then apply it to the whole block um, the reason to divide it in smaller blocks is that the processing is usually faster and um, because you have le less statistics to work with and less uh, pixels to, uh, to, um, to handle. And um, the other thing is um, 
you can also introduce physics in your um, uh, modeling. So you have uh, the digital image and volume correlation, um, which puts in uh, deformation information in the correlation process. And um, then you have a cost function, not only by correlation, but also some deformation, which is based on the physics of, uh, of the sample. So it could be something that is uh, based on um, uh, force, applied force or something, and also material properties. If you know you have um, steel or bone or something like that, you know it has some given properties and those properties you can uh, work with uh, in, in this modeling. Uh, you can also look at um, different met uh, metrics based on the distrib distributions in the data. So there is, um, in the end, you have to look for metrics, probably in the literature, metrics that are popular within your typical use case. Um, it's hard to give a perfect recipe uh, how to work with this data. Uh, another thing also, um, if you have multiple mod modalities, uh, something I plan to do uh, a lecture about, um, it's probably in two, three weeks. Um, that would be also a case when you have, for example, uh, com combining MRI and X-ray data, I want to bring those two together and get a fusion of the information. Uh, also then you need to do registration and then you also need maybe even different metrics in each uh, or specific metric that mixes those two together. So um, anyway, strain is uh, one information that we want to look at and in 1D it's pretty easy because it's just a question about the length, uh, changing length, and that is our strain. Uh, but um, when you do it in 3D, uh, the case becomes much, much uh, more complex. As you can see here, you have different displacements, you have shearing, and um, all these build up into the whole model. So it's, it's very much more complicated when you go into three dimensions and or even two dimensions. <clears throat> so, um, and um, there is a pretty, good book. Uh, I don't think I have it right now in the literature list, but if you're interested in digital image correlation, there is also a nice book at Springer Verlag uh, that um, goes into the depth of that topic. And then the strains, we have different kinds of um, strain. So we have volumetric strain, and um, that's just about changes in scale, uh, size of the, of the object, but we also have uh, deviatoric um, uh, properties uh, which changes uh, the proportions of the sample. So uh, it would be something similar to changing the, the degree of anisotropy of the sample. So those two, they, they build off the whole um, total strain effect. So it's a very complex variable to play with. Um, here is an example of um, an experiment made at Tomcat. It's about um, looking at uh, volcanic rocks and see how bubbles are moving around. In, in the beginning, they are very small bubbles and um, they evolve into large uh, complex um, uh, pore network system. And, um, of course, uh, in, in addition to that, there is also a lot of motion artifacts in the data because things are happening very rapidly in this process. So you can see here what happens to, to the data. Um, this was made a couple of years ago uh, by Mattia Pistone and Julia Five. And um, well, that's an example of uh, a tracking uh, ex experiment that was pretty hard for them to, uh, to analyze. And one way they started looking at it was to look at the two point correlation function um, and um, seeing how that changed over time. 
uh, it's actually changing pretty much in shape and orientation, uh, as you can see here. So that gives us a hint uh, on how the bubbles are evolving over time. And um, well, these are not my own experiments. I can't actually tell much more about the details on this. And um, that brings us to the end uh, of today's lecture. So we have been talking about dynamic experiments, how to plan them, how, what to think about, also tracking objects when you have the objects labeled and being able to follow them, but also using the correlation to see if how things are moving around. And uh, the last part was now about registering, taking two images, which is an important, uh, taking two images and bring them on the same grid, which is very important when you have time series to make sure that if something is shaking around, you need to make sure that they, all images in the sequence are on the same. Um, one way um, which I can tell is actually, uh, now we have some minutes left, so I can show about feature points. Uh, that's another way, instead of doing the correlation uh, or doing labeling, we can talk about feature points instead. And um, that's about finding characteristic points uh, with the help of, for example, corner det detection. And um, they can be very helpful because you reduce the complexity of the data set into a few uh, points in, in the data. And these points, they can be, help, uh, can be used then to do a much faster registration process. So um, here we have an example. Um, then where we have the raw image, we have some corner features here, and these would be the points we want to follow, the, the red dots. And that these would be our corner features. And um, if you look at uh, the bone data, we have the corner features, and um, they mark out a few places in the data. But these few places, they are already enough for very many registration processes to find the right orientation and the, the, the right uh, parameter set for the transform. And um, it's the goal, uh, the, the, the important thing is that they should be actually translational independent. So it should be possible to find the same features between different frames. And for that, we need some smart labeling. And uh, for that, we have these um, um, feature points. Let's see. Um, yeah, okay. Um, and here you can see what happens when you run uh, a simulation. Uh, you can see that these points, they follow very nicely, even in rotations and scaling, they follow always very nicely. And that is actually the, um, the property we want to follow and use in, in the registration process. Um, but now we only have points. Uh, so we need something that has a label or a clearly identifiable label. And then we come to the descriptors. And that's um, a, a uniquely identified uh, description of each uh, of these points. So we have some key points here and they get some coding. And it's a binary number uh, to get these. And um, let's run this one. I think that was just a function. And let's get some data. And now we can see we have the bone uh, movement. And you can see that there are some vectors. Uh, and it's actually good at finding matching points, mostly. But in some cases, it does some strange stuff. And there are different kinds of descriptors. Um, this one is called brief. Um, it does pretty the good job, but not the convincing, I would say. And then we could take another one, which is called ORV, so it's orientation independent. And uh, that one is much clearer able to finding a consistent uh, movement throughout the, the object. 
uh, there are some mis uh, mishits, but most of it is doing a pretty good job. So the orb descriptor is what, um, in this case, would be the best. But again, as always, the choice depending on your, the sample type you have. So you have to always to explore and see which one is doing the best on a small data set and check it out. And uh, well, that was it for today. I have, uh, let's see, that is, I think that is one. Uh, I have one little thing more. Um, that is um, from the exercises last week. Uh, I told you to try this uh, binary uh, number sequence um, on the skeleton. And I found out that when I tried, uh, when I solved it myself, that um, I had this sequence that when I had um, the numbers like this, oops. Um, and I realized it's not so easy to find um, uh, the branching points when it is like this. Uh, because what you do here is you're going like this, oops, like that, um, uh, through the, the points. And I found out that it's better if you change a little bit. So you, instead you have one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, and 128. Because now we instead investigate the neighborhood in, in a ring like this, and that makes it much easier to find the bit flips. Um, I already put um, a first, it's still a draft, I haven't com fully commented it, but I have already put um, the solution. So if you uh, get the latest uh, repository uh, update um, in the exercise uh, seven, you have the solution um, draft already there. So it's um, exercise, I don't know exactly the file name, but it's underscore solution. And then it, there you can see how I have started analyzing the data. Um, so, and uh, the exercises today, um, there are some, uh, there is um, a tutorial where you can play with the, the registration yourself a little bit. Um, with sliders, you can see what happens, how you move things around. Um, the next uh, part uh, is looking at some Kaggle exercises and um, I don't know if you have the time to solve all of them because there are pretty many, uh, but it makes sense at least to take a look at them and see what kind of problems uh, that can occur when you start talking about tracking and, um, and registration. Uh, I think that is all for today. I will stay along a little bit um, if there are any questions. So um, yeah, I wish you a nice Easter. It's still going to be sunny, so enjoy uh, your gardens or balconies or whatever. And, uh, well, see you next week. Thank you.